Hello, hello. Please have a, another glass of wine and then take a seat. I am extremely happy to invite you to a, another great lecture of yours. I'm very, very pleased that Brian with this sort of a, a talk that was arranged a little later than some of our talks, but I'm really happy he was able to make it. So he received his PhD at Cambridge in 1996 and now teaches in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University in New York. I actually know Brian quite well, but he has so many achievements that I kind of feel like I should leave this. <laughs> he, has, he has had several influential publications on the later Epipaleolithic in the Levant, and more recently has been publishing on human-animal relations with a particularly great title of one of his discussion papers, Do the Swans Deceive Us All? <laughs> yeah, my favorite piece of his, obviously, is the post that he wrote for the, my, I mean, the peer-reviewed blog that I edit, uh, Ben Dig, which is Louder Than Orange, a Chromosonic Sense of Archaeological Use Square Photography, in which he takes on Lou Binford's assertion that archaeologists don't attempt a technicolor version and he used the two Olympics to do this, it was fantastic. So, beyond his agile, exciting insights on multisensorial archaeology and human-animal relations, Brian has been a brave, leading voice in archaeology on the Israel-Palestine conflict, and was instrumental in the recent successful AAA resolution BD, uh, for BDS. Now that's a resolution just to be able to vote on a resolution later, but it's, it was a pretty significant step. So please welcome me um, to join, please join me in welcoming Brian Boyd, probably my favorite pigeon dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Thanks for coming, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the swans deceive us all. You'll get points if you tell me where that's from at the end of the lecture. Then, okay. Don't Google it. You have to know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation to talk here. I'm currently on leave in uh, in Durham for three months, so it's, uh, it was really. I didn't come from New York especially or anything, but I would, I would have. I would have, of course. You know, so it's great to be here. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the work I've been doing in, uh, in Palestine, in the West Bank. Uh, and it involves a little bit of background uh, and probably way too many slides, but I've got a really nice collection of archive slides um, belonging to the archaeologist Dorothy Garrett that I'd like to share with you as well. Um, so, I'll, I'll try and go through this. Uh, and try not to flash through the slides too quickly. So um, I'm going to give a little bit of background first of all, okay? So in 1997, uh, I became a lecturer at the University of Wales, Lampeter, which was the job I had before I went to, to Columbia. And any of you who've got jobs in British universities will know 97 was what, three, four years before the RAE uh, at the time. Um, and of course, we were all encouraged uh, by our senior colleagues to have our own projects and so on for the uh, esteem indicators and all these kinds of things. Um, so after discussions with colleagues in the UK and at the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem, uh, I decided to try and set up a project in the West Bank that would involve Palestinian academics and Palestinian students. Uh, and the thinking behind that was that Palestinian students in 1997 uh, for a long time didn't have access to the resources or the opportunities afforded to not just Europeans or American students, but Israeli students. Um, and I thought that maybe the involvement of a UK institution might be of some help there. Um, so I had discussions with colleagues uh, at Birzeit University, which is the largest university in the West Bank. Uh, and I'll place a bit of emphasis on that because I was recently asked coming through Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv, where were you staying? And I said it was in faculty housing at Birzet University. And they said, are there universities in the West Bank? <laughs> Israeli airport security. Okay, I suggest there are 15 universities in the West Bank, actually. Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, so I had discussions with Palestinian academics at uh, this incredible conference at Birzeit University in 1998. It was a conference on landscape in Palestine. 
Edward Said was the keynote speaker. Uh, and it was at that conference that uh, we decided to try and set up a joint project between Lampeter and Birzeit University on Palestinian landscape archaeology. I'll jump forward a couple of years here to 1999. Uh, I'd been asked in 1999 to participate in a session at the World Archaeological Congress in Cape Town, uh, organized by Yanis Hamalakis. Uh, it was called Archaeology and the Left. Uh, and so following on from that conference in Beirzeit, I decided to talk about the long-term effects of the British mandate on Palestinian landscapes, in particular the Balfour Declaration of 1919, uh, sorry, 1718. Uh, the effects of that on the cultural landscapes of the West Bank. And these were the archaeological landscapes that I was hoping to investigate uh, as a focus for this, this project. Uh, now, as part of my paper at WAC, I referred to a map from a very well-known book by a Palestinian scholar, Walid Khalidi's book, from 1985 called All That Remains. Um, and in that book, Halidi presents a catalog of approximately 420 Palestinian villages, Ottoman villages, that were affected to various degrees by Israeli military intervention in 1947-1948, around the time of the creation of the State of Israel. And I discussed how the remains of many of those villages are still visible in the landscape today. And that any archaeological survey undertaken in parts of the West Bank will inevitably encounter these kind of remains. And we'll have a look at those numbers. Uh, so I was arguing that it's an obligation for archaeologists to record these fragments uh, as they constitute a significant part of the history of those past cultural landscapes. I thought that was uncontentious. <laughs> so a bunch of graduate students from uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where I had many uh, colleagues, actually. Because ostensibly I'm a prehistorian, I work on the Epipaleolithic Natufian. Um, and so I have a lot of colleagues who are in prehistory there. So these students went back to Israel and related what I'd said uh, to the faculty there. And I started getting this slew of emails over the sort of weeks after the WAC conference saying, what the hell happened? I'm quoting from the emails here. What the hell happened? What did you think you were doing? And other comments pointing out that I was a prehistorian. So why was I talking about politics? So when I tried to explain the political point of the paper, British mandate, the British occupation of Palestine, therefore leading to the, uh, the clearing of the Palestinian landscapes, um, I was told, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's okay for Israelis to talk about this. It's okay for Palestinians to talk about this, but when outsiders talk about it, then they become the enemy. So that was the position I was sort of left in. So the following year, 2000, uh, since 2000, I've been involved in an archaeological project centered around a small Palestinian town called Shukba, which has various spellings of it here. Uh, Shukba gives its name to a large cave here on the west bank of the, uh, the Wadi. The Wadi is called the Wadi in Natuf, which as I'm sure you realize gives its name to the Natufian, late Epipaleolithic uh, culture in old language. Um, now this cave was excavated by the British archaeologist Dorothy Garrett in 1928, so during those first 10 years of the British mandate in Palestine. Uh, and Garrett, of course, is a central figure, and I've written a lot about this, um, 
for women's involvement in the history and practice of archaeology. Uh, at Shukba, she worked with a team primarily composed of young Palestinian women from the village and uh, other local villages. Uh, a very unusual choice for both the date and for the region. This single British woman coming in with a team of a couple of other British women, American women, a couple of American men, physical anthropologists, and she chose lots of young teenagers uh, to work at Shukba and also on her later excavations in Mount Carmel on the Mediterranean a couple of years later. She brought in the guys for the heavy lifting, basically, but it was the women that did all the careful stratigraphic excavation, as you'll see in the, in the cave. <clears throat> um, so Garrett subsequently, uh, just a bit of history, she became the first woman professor at the University of Cambridge, not just first women professor of archaeology, first women professor at the University of Cambridge, uh, 39 to 52. And she was instrumental in securing admission for women to the university uh, in 1948. Now, her work at Shukba, pioneering fieldwork at Shukba, uh, laid the foundations for the entire Levantine prehistoric sequence, Paleolithic to the Neolithic, basically. Um, and she left a series of archaeological research questions uh, that we're still kind of struggling with today uh, in that Epipaleolithic or Mesolithic period, as she called it, using the European terminology at the time. Um, and she named this the culture she found at, at Shukba. Hold on. She was at Newnham, Cambridge. Just a couple of quick photographs from her publication. I'll show you some of her actual photos in a moment. So that's the cave we just looked at, at Shukba. Here it is under excavation. Note this for a moment. This is the rear chamber in the cave. See, it's a completely flat floor in the back here, OK? I'll come back to that in a little while. And just a plan of her, that's her plan of the cave. You'll see more of this in a moment. Her sections. Layer B is the Natufian, this Epipaleolithic, Mesolithic culture, typified by these kind of uh, crescent-shaped uh, bladelets called lunates, microlithic industry. Okay, and this is the first time that the Mesolithic had been discovered in, in the Middle East. And there she is at the, towards the end of her life in the night, she died in 69. <clears throat> so she was able to identify this Natufian culture and she thought they were the first agriculturists because she found things like what she called sickle blades and things like that and sickle hafts and so on, ground stone material, things like that. Um, and so we're still kind of struggling with those questions today. This is the, the earliest origins of agriculture, sedentism and plant and animal domestication. That's the hallmarks of the Natufian, if you like. Uh, and we know now it's the beginning of those very profound environmental changes, uh, ecological changes wrought by the first sedentary human occupation that some people are now arguing is the beginning of the Anthropocene, of course. Uh, we can talk about that. Now, Garrett left Shukba in 28, so she was only there for one season. And she went to the Carmel Caves for a variety of reasons uh, the year after. and. Shukba remains untouched since 28. Um, in 2000, uh, I went there with colleagues from Birzet with the, the notion of re-excavating the cave and also doing survey work in the Wadi Natuf. Uh, so this is the Wadi Natuf in 2000. You can see here the Palestinians from the, 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 the town of Shukba, it's about 4,000 people live there. This is their agricultural land, their olive trees, uh, you can see their field boundaries, and so on. This is the road, by the way, if you're wanting some, I didn't put that map up. It's basically on the route between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, or Tel Aviv and Ramallah. Okay, in the West Bank. There'll, there'll be some maps in a moment. And that's the cave in also in 2000, uh, in the spring, of course. <clears throat> So uh, we went there with the view to renewed fieldwork and the testing of some of Garrod's research questions using 
you know, more modern techniques, uh, obviously. This is the entrance to the cave in here. This is the terrace, which wasn't excavated by Garrett. So that was one of our, uh, one of our uh, aims was to excavate there. So we did some survey work, cleaned up Garrett's sections in the cave. This is a Natufian mortar that she describes in her publication. It's been lying on the cave floor since 1928. And we had to help with uh, some local people as usual. You know, you have to go and talk to the, the mayor and his team and you get trailed around by teenagers and children wanting to help out. This guy here with his arm in a sling uh, designated himself our driver. <laughs> we had to, we had a hire car from Jerusalem and he insisted on driving. You know. <laughs> so that was kind of hairy. <laughs> this is the back chamber of the cave that I just showed you, that flat surface. Garrett never excavated there. But we went back in 2000 with this enormous sinkhole. And if you drop a rock in there, it takes about 10 seconds to hit the bottom. So we're going to need some serious shoring and geological advice and investigations uh, to, to, to have a look at that. Anyway, uh, this is one of the head families of the village. Maybe everyone in Shukwa is called Shalash. Uh, this is Mahmoud, and that was his son we just looked at. This is Zoe Crossland, who we'll be talking to you tomorrow. Uh, now also a professor at Columbia. Is it the same group tomorrow? Is it a different? It's slightly different. Slightly yeah. different. OK, well, she'll be here. Uh, so we did this preliminary uh, field work, and we published then a brief note about it in antiquity while Martin Carver was still the uh, editor, in fact. So that's 2000. As you know, 2000 also saw the start of the second intifada. So that basically put our field work on hold, as you might imagine. Uh, and we didn't start again until 2012, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, the, as I say, the, the second intifada was announced in the summer of 2000 um, and the fieldwork was put on hold for a decade, basically, uh, due to the increased difficulties of obtaining site permissions, access, the construction of the separation barrier, the wall, started then, uh, and the, uh, the placing of roadblocks and army and police checkpoints between Israel and the West Bank. Um, so all of these elements kind of caused disarray in travel and movement between, for example, Jerusalem and Ramallah and within the West Bank itself. So it was, it was literally impossible, plus the chaos of the Palestinian Authority, which I'll, I'll touch on in a moment. Now, in the interim period there between 2000 and 2012, I was offered a project in Israel by a colleague in the Israel Antiquities Authority. Now, the Israel Antiquities Authority is the body that issues licenses for all archaeological excavations within Israel, but also within the West Bank in the areas that are not Palestinian controlled. As you know, the West Bank, as you probably know, the West Bank is divided into areas A, B and C. Area A is Palestinian controlled, B joint Israel Palestine, area C is Palestinian controlled. And that's important for what I'm going to talk about. So this colleague in the Israel Antiquities Authority, who is the only Palestinian who works for, for the Israel Antiquities Authority in the prehistory department, he said, look, you're not this work in the West Bank's not going to happen for the foreseeable future. Why don't you do some survey work in the Jordan Valley? We need work to be done. There's big blank areas. So I kind of agreed to do that. Um, and so we did some landscape survey in the northern Jordan Valley, north of the Sea of Tiberias, Sea of Galilee, just south of the Lebanese border, so the very north of Israel. Um, and so here are some of these landscapes. This is the Lebanese border up here. This is the route over the Golan to Syria here. Jordan's over here. So this is running north of the Jordan Valley. Very, very fertile land because it had been drained in 1948 by the state of Israel. So just a few of these landscapes. That's looking across to Jordan. The River Jordan's just down here. 
So this is north, south. And as we were going through this landscape, as expected, we kept coming across archaeological features, those described in Walid Khalidi's book, All That Remains. We were ostensibly searching for prehistoric sites. I wanted to find the Tufian sites in this area because there are none in this area at all, or early Neolithic sites. Um, so nonetheless, we recorded all these. You can just, I'm just going to flash through some of these. Some of them are, okay, just let you get your eye in for a moment. Get that scale, here's the crossland here. So the remains of these agricultural landscapes you can see terrace walls, you can see circular structures here. So this is a, an Ottoman landscape, so pre-1917, pre-1948 uh, agricultural rural landscape. So these kind of things, enclosures, probably for sheep, goats, things like that, the remains of water mills. We also found a few British mandate period police stations, abandoned but still there. And you know things like bedrock features that were very difficult to, to age, but we recorded everything anyway. We hardly found any prehistoric remains. Found a lot of caves and rock shelters that would need excavation. Uh, some of them quite substantial. These large uh, limestone built enclosures. These are, we just assumed 17th to 19th century probably. And you know we, so we recorded these abandoned uh, Palestinian landscapes. Some, you can see all the clearance cairns down here that the modern Israeli farmers have uh, cleared for their own agriculture. And we'd find things like you know, these interesting, you get these all over the Middle East, they're games, yeah. aren't they? You know, for you know, shepherds and things playing. I don't know what they're actually called. Moncala. Moncala, that's it. So, these, uh, so we just we basically recorded everything, bedrock features, architecture. This is the remains of a, a whole village, actually, that's uh, just barely, barely visible. That's the remains of some houses. There were also some graves. And it was very interesting to, to you know, be going up and down the Jordan Valley. Some of these sites are substantial, but they're very, very hidden away from public view. Uh, and I just want to use one example here. This is called Abu Yabis, um, and we discovered it because we were just driving around and we found this little area to park the car. And Tobias Richter, the archaeologist who was working with it at the time, he uh, he got out of the car and was kind of looking over the edge down into this kind of ravine, and he says, "Come and look at this." And we saw these buildings, and we so we clambered down, and we found all these. Uh, Islamic, an uh, Islamic cemetery, basically, religious buildings, this kind of uh, mausoleums. So pretty substantial. This is, you know, 18th century, probably, maybe even earlier, there's some Mamluk uh, architectural elements. But this is just lying, you know, partially destroyed. Oh, that's the wrong way around, sorry. But gravestones. So you can see the remains of all these these buildings here. Take note of the, this woodland at the back here for a moment. And so, so we recorded everything in great detail. Things like ovens. I'll just go through these just to show you the extent of them. And you know, in, off, in really good condition as well, some of these with haram and so on. Any of you who do, you know, Mamluk or Ottoman material will be familiar with this. But this particular uh, shrine on this site is, is still in use today by um, the families who used to used to live there. Now, the reason I say remember this here, okay, now the site we're looking at is down in here, okay? And the main Jordan Valley Road is over here. Now, part of the strategy uh, after the abandonment of the villages uh, in 1947-48, um, if, if the villages were completely destroyed, the Israelis would often plant woods and forests and parks. So there's all this kind of symbolic uprooting of olive trees, but symbolic planting of pine trees 
so you, if you if you find a kind of new forest area, it's pretty certain that there was a Palestinian village there at some point. But what is interesting here, when we drove back round, you can see the road here, which leads back down. We sort of clambered up through our uh, all the rubble and so on to get up there, and we started seeing these kind of things at the side of the road. Jewish National Fund, which I'll come to in a moment. Someone from Ireland here, Dublin, Ireland, Memorial Grove, Jewish National Fund. This part, this woodland named after this person, Marcus someone. And this is Tobias Richter again. The reason he's covering this up, he's German, right? He's covering this up because it says Tobias someone from North Germany or something here. <laughs> um, but again, Jewish National Fund, funding the, um, the, the park. And you see this a lot. This is right across the road and there's public signs coming. Come and visit the Agamon Hula. Look out, the Hula is the name of the, the valley here, the Hula Valley, north of the Jordan Valley. It's a big nature reserve there. And you can see here where all the, the Jewish National Fund money came from. They were Baltimore, Denver, uh, LA, in recognition of their outstanding support of developing Israel's water resources past the 1940s, 1950s, where they drained the entire valley in that area. And everlasting devotion to the state of Israel. So on the one hand, we've got these ruined 420 Palestinian villages in the Jordan Valley and into the West Bank and in other parts in the Golan. And completely unsignposted, not recorded. You can't really visit them officially, but we have all these pristine Jewish National Fund um, monuments. And that's in the, this is in the same place. When you go into the, the little woodland area, this is the kind of thing you see. Another one here. The Nathan David family lookout from Ottawa, Canada, have paid for this. So, you know, obviously water is a vital and important resource to be controlled. I mean, Israel today controls all the water in the West Bank. Um, so, uh, you get an idea. We've got, we were faced daily by these ruins of the pre-1948 inhabitation of that landscape, discussed by Khalidi, um, while ostensibly we were looking for prehistoric sites. So we carried out the obligation to record everything uh, according to normal survey conventions. Um, but for me personally, it was a bit frustrating because, uh, or unsatisfying maybe, because I felt that after the experience at WAC in 99, um, I felt it was maybe a step too far to kind of publish this uh, potentially very politically charged material. Um, I was a prehistorian after all. Uh, and I think I say in the piece that I published in your, uh, in Middle Savagery, you know, that thing, um, it, it's, it, it sounds like self-censorship and I think, yes, it probably was, but I'm not going to publish this material, uh, in the next year or two. Uh, and hopefully it's, it will be the first archeological presentation of the, dis the disappeared villages. There's a number of anthropological and historical texts, Rochelle Davis, uh, Palestinian villages, Susan Slyomovich, the object of memory, discussing the, the processes of 1947-48 uh, that the Palestinians call the Nakba, the catastrophe. Um, so we're going to publish it anyway. So that was 2004-2005. Um, And then when I got the position at Columbia in 2006, um, I decided that was really enough of that. I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable working in, in Israel. And anyway, my Israeli colleagues don't want us there anyway. There's few enough Israeli prehistorians uh, working here as it is. We don't need any foreigners here, your neo-colonial archeology. span So we didn't feel exactly welcome anyway, <laughs> but... Um, so anyway, I, I, I was all this time I was in touch with Birzeit University and colleagues there. And um, since 2011, I've been working with students and colleagues from Birzeit on a joint Columbia Birzeit uh, anthropological project in the West Bank. Um, as I'm sure you know, as in the 80s and the 90s, the undergraduate students in Palestine don't have access to the same resources as their Israeli counterparts. And of course, the, 
they are restricted in their movement. They need visas to even go outside their own towns. They can't travel to Jerusalem, which is 30 minutes away uh, without a visa. Uh, international travel is extremely difficult, not just for students, but also for faculty, staff, lecturers, and so on. Um, and they often use this kind of trope. It's quite interesting. There's, uh, you know, they live 30 minutes away from the Mediterranean, the students that I work with in Birzeit, it's near Ramallah. It's a 30 minute drive to the Mediterranean and you know they're 20 years of age and most of them have never seen the Mediterranean in their lives because of the restrictions on, on their movement um, but they're very clever at using that as a kind of uh, rhetoric of the occupation you know some of them have seen the sea they can get there occasionally if they get a visa or if we drive them there or something like that but um, and that, that's the kind of thing that the BDS, the boycott group, you know, people are, the activists are picking up in this kind of language, they've never seen the sea, it's so emotive and empathetic and so on, but, you know, they know what they're doing, they know what they're saying, you know, so we have to be working in, within that and around that. Um, it's much more complex than that, and that's what I'm saying. So, since 2011, we decided to try and renew this Shukba Wadi Natuf project. Uh, and we thought it would be quite straightforward. We could just go back in there, get a license from the Palestine Department of Antiquities and recommence the excavation and survey work. Oh no. <laughs> um, because obviously since uh, the building of the wall and so on, things have changed geographically quite uh, sort of dramatically. Uh, I'm going to show you a few black and white pictures for a moment. These are Dorothy Garrett's own pictures from 1928, okay? Uh, so this was the cave at Shukba. This is actually her spoil heap, but there's a thing here. Mm -hmm. Which we've had a good look through, of course, you know, and it's scattered over the, you know, the nine, almost 90 years since she was working there. We find a lot of lithics and things scattered all over the place down into the wadi. Okay, so here's, here's her team part of a team working in the cave in April 1928. There's the spoiler. So the town of Shukba is just at the top of this cliff, okay? So we thought we would do, this is Shukba in 1928, okay? The cave is just over the, over the hill there. So this is what it looked like when Garrett was working there in 28. There were only like 800 people there, it's about 4,000 now, something like that. And I'll just quickly show you some of these. Now, her archive is great. It's held in Paris and in Oxford. Um, and, you know, it's a real great sort of wealth of archive material. And what I'm doing with the Columbia and Birzet students, where, um, we have a museum anthropology program and an oral history program running between the two universities. And what we're doing is we're getting the students from Birzet to try and locate some of the remaining surviving families because some of them remember their grandparents working at Shukba with Garrett. It's great when you talk, we, they, they organized Hamid Salem, my co-director and me to give a talk in the mosque and all the men turned out and a few women at the back, of course. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, we showed some of these pictures from Dr. Garrett's 1928 archive and we, we've been able to find the buildings, no problem. And you know, these little kids, some, it was amazing to see some of these men sitting at the front, you know, these elderly Palestinian men, kind of welling up with tears. That's my uncle, that's my grandfather, you know, things like that. Uh, so I think we're, we're gonna have some quite, I mean, the, 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 young, the oldest people in Shukba are now in their eighties. So they would have been even smaller than this when Garage was working uh, there. But they have photograph albums and memorabilia, and they all know some of the senior members of the village at the time. They're, oh yes, we know that's uh, Abu Shalash or whatever they do. This is Garrett here with uh, George and Edna Woodbury, who are American archaeologists. And so we've got all these kind of photographs of various colonial visitors and. Uh, That's gathered at the end of there. And so, we've, I mean, it's interesting because some of these characters quite clearly have been to Jerusalem 
or to Jaffa, which is now Tel Aviv, or maybe even to Beirut in the north, because they're not wearing Palestinian clothes in 28, where most people would, they've got suits and kind of snazzy gear and things. So, but th these are people like, you know, th this was obviously one of the, the elders at the time. So we've been able to identify some of these people and the oral histories are very interesting. One old man told us, I'll just flick through these just to let you see some of them. Um, one old gent told us that they referred to Garrett as the queen of the wadi. <laughs> And it's interesting, the oral histories are coming out with some interesting stories because Garrett, and this is some of her excavation photographs, this is the very first Natufian skeleton ever found, uh, the first day of excavation. Um, she found about 40 burials in, inside the cave, um, dating to late Natufians, so 11,000 years ago, so um, she thought it was much later at the time. But uh, she also found Mysterian Middle Paleolithic remains here. You know, there's Neanderthal remains from but not much in the way of bones, a few teeth, but a lot of uh, classic Mysterian artifacts and so on. And it's amazing how the people today even know about that. They, they, when you talk to them about the Natufian, the Mesolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic transition kind of stuff, they know what you're talking about. Even the, the sort of local people say, ah, this town is the first place where where men broke the land. That's what they say, agriculture. The first place, time agriculture took place here. Um, and they talk about the Neanderthals. Mahmoud Shalash, who I showed you earlier, he took us into the cave and he pointed to the little uh, side cave where the Mysterian levels are. And he told us in really great English, he said, here, monkey men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, you know, he knows what's there. He knows there's pre-humans there. So, but so there's all these stories about Garrod. It must have been quite extraordinary, a village of 800 people and she just shows up. And so we have a lot of our excavation photographs. There's that back chamber again. Um, okay, so this is digging the front chamber. It's, uh, I don't see a grid anywhere, but, uh, <laughs> but she did a very good job of it, you know. And there's some great shots like this, looking out into the wadi. Now, I, don't, I couldn't find any photographs in the archive of the women excavating, but this, this is from Tabun, which is the lower Paleolithic cave on Mount Carmel that she went to the year after Shukba. You can quite clearly see here all the Palestinian teenage girls working away there. Okay, so that's how we that's how we left it, and that's how Gavid left it, you know, in 1928, and how we came across it in 2000. Um, and then, as I say, we went back in 2012. In that interim period between 2000 and 2012, as I say, we've had the Second Intifada, and we've had the division of the West Bank into areas A, B, and C. Now, the problem for us at Shukba and the Wadi and the Tuf is if I can let me just go back to this. Okay, so the cave is here, the wadi is here, the town of Shukba is at the top of the hill. The town of Shukba up here since 2011 is an area A, Palestinian controlled. From the top of the cave, down to the wadi is now in area C, Israeli controlled. Which means if we want to do any archaeological work in the cave or in the wadi, we have to get a license from the Israel Department of Antiquities, the Israel Antiquities Authority, not the Palestine Department of Antiquities. So the dilemma there is that the Palestinians of Birzet will not negotiate with the Israel Antiquities Authority, or there's another organization called the Archaeology Department of the Civil Administration, which deals also with Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank. Um, and they're only interested in Israeli archaeological remains or Jewish archaeological remains in the West Bank. And it might surprise you to know that throughout this whole period, from 1967, from the Six-Day War to the present day, 
the Israelis have been carrying out archaeological excavations in the West Bank, in Palestinian and Israeli areas. So if there's a settlement going to be built, or the separation barrier is having an extension to it or whatever, the civil administration of the Israel Antiquities Authority go in there ahead of time, do the archaeology, so the archaeology has been done. But um, So archaeological excavations have been taking place in, in there, not by the Palestinians, I have to say. So this is the problem for us, we're now caught between area A and area C. I do for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, that's fine. Okay. So we are uh, kind of around here somewhere. So this is the, the border with, with Israel. Can you tell me it's over here? So in 2012, I went back, and this is what the Wadi Natuf looked like. Okay, this is the wadi, the cave is over here, because the Israelis can do what they like here, basically. Um, what you see here is the construction of a road running between Ramallah and Tel Aviv. It's called a settler road because it connects the settlements uh, in the West Bank, the illegal settlements in the West Bank. Uh, and of course, it's cutting right through the wadi Natuf. And because it's a prehistoric, an area of prehistoric archaeological remains, they, they're not really interested in it. Um, actually, I presented this picture at a conference in Paris, a Natufian conference in Paris in 2010, and uh, my Israeli colleagues in the audience said I shouldn't have shown that picture, because it's not very nice. <laughs> I said, no, you're right, it's not very nice. Um, so I shouldn't have shown that, apparently. Um, so this is what we've been dealing with since 2012. We can't do any excavation work in the cave. We can clean up the sections and things. We can't actually put a trowel into the ground. We can do survey work under the pretense that we're just out for a country walk, <laughs> basically. So we're doing the recording, but we can't pick up collections and things like that. And and you can just see the, the, the town of Shukba up there. Um, the other problem is, is that the wadi is now being used as a dumping area, a trash area. As you can see here, this is an old Israeli ambulance dumped here. There's another vehicle up here. This, what you're looking at here, this is basically a, a giant mound of rubbish, a mound of garbage. It's 30 feet high. So when you, when you enter, rather than seeing that lovely green wadi that we looked at earlier, this is what you see when you go into the wadi. And that's the settler road running, cutting the two villages off from each other. Okay, so we have to clamber over this. Now, look at this here. That's the road, but they're now actually in the wadi. They're quarrying for stone, for settlement building and things like that. <clears throat> and uh, I have a PhD student at Columbia who's just finished actually. And she's been doing a project on uh, the kind of social significance of garbage in the West Bank. Um, and she's been finding out some quite interesting things about this dumping of all this kind of trash. Um, I'll just read a little bit from her. Uh, I've pulled a paragraph from a paper she recently published. Major waste related problems have plagued the village for well over a decade. Israeli industrial dumping, the burning of X-ray images for silver extraction from Ramallah area hospitals, so Palestinian hospitals, and the spillage of raw sewage into Shukba village lands. Israelis from both sides of the Green Line have been dumping municipal and industrial wastes on Shukba's lands for more than a decade. A small number of local Palestinian landowners have been accepting fees from truck drivers to allow dumping on their lands. So it's not as black and white as the Israelis dumping in Palestine, right? Uh, the local residents often set fire to the dumps in order to shrink them, get rid of them. Uh, and when they did this, they reported that the dumps sometimes burned for three or four months on end, even when you pour water on them, or even when it rained. 
And it turns out that there's toxic materials here from hospitals in Ramallah and from whatever material these drivers have been given by the Israelis to dump here. Um, and it seems we've got some medical reports saying that there are causes of lung and re reproductive problems amongst uh, that people have been suffering from in Shukba. Um, and a few of the landowners from the, t the town of Shukba itself are allowing dumping on their lands for you know 200 shekels, which is like 50, I don't know, it's 50 dollars, 30 pounds uh, per truckload, something like that. I see it's like 30 feet high mounds of garbage, some of it toxic. Uh, and we've kind of pulled this archaeological project into the middle of this. Um, and you know, in the, in the town itself, there's constant electricity cuts and the water is controlled. The water is often turned off at certain times of the day. They don't have access to clean water and so on. So when we roll into town in 2012 and talk to the local people and say, hey, cultural heritage, they say, no, we want electricity and we want clean water. Thank you very much. But now we've been talking to them in the last sort of 18 months or so about um, they're getting very keen on having a, a museum, a community museum in the town. So we applied for various pockets of money to just try and set this up. So it's a kind of community museum. Um, and we've asked people, you know, the oral histories will be part of it. And we've asked people to give us any sort of materials they think might be useful for a kind of folk museum. So we're getting agricultural implements. And some of the women of the town have given us nice Palestinian dresses, which are all very uh, distinctive. You know, each village has its own dresses. They have their own coffee cups and things like that. You know, and uh, as you'll see, there's a, I can pass these, a lot of car dumping in Shukba as well. It's a very rough little town. I was trying to think what the British equivalent would be. You know, I was thinking, because I haven't lived in Wales for a decade, you know, it's very much like those kind of really slightly kind of bereft little Welsh valleys towns, you know, very rough little towns where the sort of industrial heart has gone, you know. Um, so they're very, you know, a lot of the kids steal cars and dump them there as well. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated picture. Anyway, so this is, I just pulled this from Google Earth. Shukba is here. This is, this is uh, the cave here that someone has kindly. Uh, but there's two other local villages, Kibia and Shaktin. Now these used to be very in very close communication, but as you can see, the secular road runs right through the middle of them. And this is the quarrying that I was just showing you. And the quarrying is basically destroying, you can see here that we have the olive groves that I showed you earlier. It's just gone right through the olive groves. You know, it's this process of uh, humiliation, if you like, uprooting the the, the olive trees and the olive plantations that belong to Shukba and Shaptin. And these are cut off. You have to go through a checkpoint here. It's a five minute walk. And it basically, because Shukba is in area A and their agricultural lands are now in area C, what would normally take the farmers five or 10 minutes just to walk down that little road and go to their olive trees or take their goats out or whatever, now it takes them an hour because they have to go through an Israeli checkpoint in the morning and then they have to go back in the evening. Uh, I mean, normally they just go back and forth, back and forth, but they have to they stay out all day now because it's what, they don't want to go through the checkpoint five or six times, you know, go back home for your lunch or whatever. Um, but anyway, the agricultural lands are being destroyed. Um, and it's even bigger than this because this is a Google map from, I think this picture was taken in 2012. Well, or something, I don't remember. I had the actual date on it 2013, yeah. and uh, it's twice the size now when I was there last year. So, anyway, so uh, what, we're, what we're doing is getting this local community museum together at the moment in lieu of doing any archaeological excavations, and it's working out really well because the the local schools and community centres want to get involved with Birzet University because they'd like to send their kids there at some point. Um, and so and the students are getting involved, they're doing oral histories, they're doing landscape survey, um, things like that. Um, and so hopefully over the next, sort of, we've got some funding for three years from Colombia, um, we'll get this museum established uh, and run 
we're going to be sending students from Colombia there, and hopefully we're going to get students from Beerzet to come to Colombia to do master's programs in oral history, museum anthropology, if they can get through the red tape, of course. That's that. That's that's the idea. Really. But it's great how some someone just very recently, uh, an Israeli actually, has taken photographs of Shukwa and put them on the, the what do you call it? Tag them on on the Google Map. Shukwa cave. You discover the first remains of Natufi, and that's what you see if you go to Google Maps. Uh, anyway, so the Wadi Natuf is is undergoing this process of destructive landscape alteration, partly through this Israeli settlement road building, large-scale burning and dumping of industrial and municipal waste and so on. And I'm trying to get my Israeli colleagues who've been working in the Natufian for 20, 30, 40 years. This is the Natufian type site. This is where Garud discovered the Natufian. And they're not interested in this. This happens in all many parts of the world, this kind of thing. What's the point? You know, they just they call it the Wild West. They don't they want they won't go to the West Bank. So they don't want to engage with this. <coughs> what a depressing note to end on. But anyway, that's <laughs> that's that's the project as it, as it currently stands. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll wrap up there. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to. <coughs> Fantastic, though, as you were able to get sort of the landscape shots and, and you know what happened before, and then get a good picture of it going through this entire process. It's really a great snapshot of that entire sort of the conflict in just one small place. So thank you for that. I choose. Questions, Gareth. I'm really interested in hearing more about the um, uh, experience of Gareth going to the town and female archaeologists mm. in that region at that time and the recollections of that because it seems incredible to us it must sure yeah, yeah. i mean as i say no there's no one alive there now that actually remembers her you know but they but they know that their their grandparents or their uncles or whoever who worked there and um yeah apparently she used to we, we have her diaries from Shukba, the hills in the paris museum saint germain saint germain online and uh, they have the, the uh, Pamela Smith from Cambridge wrote a PhD on women archaeologists, British archaeologists, and she discovered this hat box in the museum, and it was tied up with a little note on it saying Shukwa 1928, and we all thought that Gareth had destroyed her, her notes. That was, the, that was the kind of gossip, the rumours, and Pamela Smith in the late 90s found this Shukwa archive, so that's where we got these photographs. Um, and so she has her diaries and her personal field notes in there. So we're, I'm digitizing those at the moment. I'm going over there in a few weeks to hopefully get that started uh, to make that available online. So, but yeah, the, she uh, she camped in the village, uh, or she was given a house occasionally. So she was quite. I think she was quite embedded in the local uh, community there. So, but yeah, I, I, I haven't read many details, yeah. but I'm hopefully going to get those online. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks very much. It was great. Um, the community museum. When did who first brought that up? And you know, has it been the, well in the ether for decades? No, was, no, yeah. only since two thousand and twelve. Actually, um, we Hamid Salem, who's the chair of archaeology at Birzeit University, and he's my co-director on the project. Um, he said, "Let's go and talk to the mayor." at Shukba. So they had this mayor's office and they were really interested in, you know, the cave and we told them the history of it. They didn't really know that much about it. The, the, the young people didn't know much about it. It's the older people that know about it. Um, you know, they know it for a place where they go to keep out of the rain when they're taking the goats down to the wadi and things like that. You know? um, and so Hamad and I had been talking about this. What about a, a small museum in the town? And there was just this kind of light went on in the mayor's head, you know, and saw an opportunity, I think. And they have given us a building, which is interesting in itself. They have given us a disused mosque, which hasn't been used for 30 years, apparently. And we were kind of wondering about this, you know, is, does it have to be, what do you call it, de sanctified or something, whatever. But they've given us this, this, this building, and so it needs new electrics and things like that. 
But they were very keen to have this, and it's right in the town centre. I don't know what the security is going to be like, you know, because we're talking about, oh, shall we have computers in there? Shall we have, you know, multimedia stuff? But I say it's a rough little town, and so maybe we'll have some parts of it at the university at Bears Head, which isn't far away. And we'll have the kind of maybe artifacts. And we're doing a lot, we're hoping to do a lot of the, you know, 3D imaging and printing of artifacts, things like that, 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 that are held in various European museums from Shukba, from Gareth's excavations. Uh, rather than borrowing artifacts, having them on loan, we'll get those in there, 3D uh, versions of it. Um, and it was great because the mayor showed us around this disused mosque and you know, he was very entrepreneurial about it, as you might expect. <laughs> because, you know, as I said, the, the, sorry, I should come back to this. The other part of the story is we applied to UNESCO, World Heritage, you know, this is the earliest, you know, it's Natufian, Origins of Agriculture, blah, 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 blah. Um, so they put us on this long list that they have. So we managed to get onto that in 2013, but we have to pay $20,000 to get any further than that. I didn't realise that at the time, actually. Um, and UNESCO said to us, well, actually, you know, you have to demonstrate tourism potential. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> you, know, it's like, you, know, you, see, you can't get there. You know, it's very, very difficult to get there. Uh, even from Ramallah, you know, checkpoints and police and army and all this kind of stuff. And once you get there, there's nothing there. I think there are like three shops in the town or something like that. And a mosque, obviously. Uh, a couple of schools. But he showed us around this disused mosque in 2012 or 13. And he said, shows us this room. He said, this is where you will have the exhibitions, this room. And here, you can have an area for children. And here, he showed us this big empty room with a glass wall looking at. This is where you will have the restaurant and gift shop. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, right, okay, think about <laughs> So, you know, so they're, they're, you know, the, the, the town council is very keen for us to do this. And because it's in Area A, we can get support from the Palestine Department of Culture and Antiquities. We don't even need to deal with the Israelis at all. If we do anything in the cave or the wadi, we do have to deal with the Israelis. I don't know how we're going to do that especially given the boycott situation, because none of us want to engage with Israeli institutions at this stage. So, but I, th I think it's something we'll, uh, I'm going over there on the 26th of this month uh, to have a meeting with everyone, the town council and everything. So hopefully by the summer, we'll be able to start getting things like electricians in there and you know, start you know, imagining what it actually might look like. It's nothing big, it's just like a small community folklore, archaeology museum. You know, so. I was very encouraged. I visited Shetland last summer and there was all these great little fishing museums all over the place in very small town. This is what we need at Shetland, this kind of thing. Just a few cases, some nice pictures, some things given us, given to us by local people, agricultural implements, costumes. It's enough to get going with. You know, that kind of thing. I'm interested by your forthcoming publication on the Palestinian villages. Mm. But given that however neutral you attempt to be in your publication, you're probably going to come in for some flack. How are you going to handle it? Are you going to attempt to be neutral or not? And just no, we're just going to publish them. You know, we just all we have to, you know, it's going to be a very descriptive catalogue of here are the Ottoman and Mamluk remains that uh, survive after 1947-48. I don't really know what else we can say about it. Because it's going to be a pretty dry archaeological <laughs> catalog. <laughs> but you know, Walid Khalidi's book, you know, he identifies all the villages. But we we've, we've got the advantage, I guess, of you know we have this proper archaeological recording of all the buildings and field systems and. Uh, the graveyards, the cemeteries, things like that. But you're right, I mean, it's, um, I think even just by doing the work is going to be a bit of a hassle, but what's the alternative? You know, is not to do it. You know, so it's, but yeah, point taken. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, I imagine it'll just probably go to a BAR or something like that. So the, the material's there if you want to do anything with it. Is that, I think that's that's my kind of thinking on it at the moment anyway. But yeah, absolutely, no, it will, it will be, uh, yeah. Archaeological gray literature as incendiary. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> and it, just, to, just could you talk just a little bit about um, the sort of personal ramifications of this work and, and how it's impacted you? Yeah, well, um, 
Yeah, it's I talk a lot about this with colleagues in Colombia because most I'm, I'm in an anthropology department and it's mostly sociocultural, cultural, anth social anthropologists. And it's kind of easy for them, in a sense, to take part in this boycott kind of work, you know, because if you're an anthropologist, you're you know usually working on your own, you're working in a town or a village, and it's quite easy not to work there, just go somewhere else and do your eth ethnography or whatever. But you know, when we were working in Palestine or, or Israel, more, you know, we built up a team. Of Palestinians and Israelis, and you know that all has to go. You know, so you've got employment for people. You know, all these kind of things. But no, it has caused a lot of problems. For I don't care. You know, I don't have to work with the Israelis anymore. I'm I'm, I'm very happy working with the Palestinian archaeologists uh, because firstly they asked us to do this project, and they are very keen on collaborations, and they're not in any way say, well looking for western money or anything like that you know if, if we have money for shukla next year from colombia that's the money we use if we don't have money from colombia then hamid tries to get it from there's it you know it's just that's the way we're doing it it's very small scale it's totally collaborative um but yeah i mean my israeli colleagues they cut me a bit of slack after the whack thing which was why they did this project in israel it was trying to get me back into the fold in a sense i think um, and I was happy to do it, you know, because I, 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 I'm, I'm interested in doing bridge building projects. Ideally, I would love to have Israeli and Palestinian students working on the project, but it's just not, I mean, physically, logistically possible at the moment. Um, but I think now we've done this and the boycott thing was the last straw, so I don't think the Israelis are going to really engage with, with us or me uh, at the moment. You know, I just published an article on uh, just on in the two and stuff, it's in a, in a fish shift for the archaeologist Andrew Moore, who's just retired. And you know, in the spirit of the boycott, which is institutions, not individuals, I just did what I always do with my articles, you know, put it on Academia EDU, sent the PDF to all my colleagues, including the Israelis. And you know, I was getting emails back saying, Do you want us to sully this with our eyes by reading it? You know, and I was like, you know, in the spirit of institutions not individuals I'm still you know sharing my research you know, but they can't seem to see what the difference is between the boycott of in institutions and individuals it's a great area I know but it's, um, that's what they said in South Africa <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you have one last question I think you've been waiting for, well two last questions you've both been waiting for a while so I'm back in the red first in the middle yeah. two is fine <laughs> <laughs> Um, you, you talked about the academic boycott of Israeli, of Israeli institutions and it's something we're hoping to pass in, in the university. But sure. You also talked about um, the, the sort of whitewashing of Palestinian history and religious by the Israeli government after 47 48. Mm. Do you know of any projects by Israeli institutions, academic or otherwise, that work now um, still in, in doing so? In, in studying that material or in denying that it in happened? Deny, in denying the Palestinian Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, just in general, people don't talk about it. But there are a few Israeli archaeologists from Tel Aviv and from Ben Gurion University who are doing anthropological work uh, in tracing, you know, they're talking to Palestinians who were displaced. So they're either in refugee camps in Jordan or Lebanon uh, or in the West Bank. Uh, um, and so they're doing kind of anthropological work. There's no one really doing archaeological work on it. Um, but it, you know, just in general, people don't talk about it. You know, when, when, I, when I speak to Israeli colleagues about the landscapes, or the, the Ottoman landscapes that no longer exist, they never call it Palestinian. They always say medieval or Ottoman or something like that. You know, they never say they're Palestinians, which is a kind of nebulous term. Maybe. But, um, and they'll say things like, well, even if that did happen, you know, there's, there's always a kind of ambiguity there in the discussion that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Good question, thank you. <laughs> yeah, my question comes back to museums. I wonder if you have any contact with the Palestinian Museum mm. that's due to open sometime this year. Yeah, have, sure, in fact. Um, and I know they've been doing some work on networking with small museums across the West Bank. They have, they have. Yeah, uh, the, one of the guys from the museum, whose name's escaping me, he's going to be at this meeting at the end of February in, in Beerset. So uh, we absolutely would 
inviting it because the, the new this is this new Palestinian museum that's opening. Well, it's supposed to every year for the last year, the <coughs> years it's supposed to be opening. They have a date for May this year. It was like an official opening, and their first exhibitions are going to be in the fall, in, in the autumn. Listen to me, I've only been away ten years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the autumn, <laughs> and. Uh, <clears throat> But they don't have any archaeology in their museum, no, no, no. which is interesting. Yeah. So that's kind of what we want to talk to them about. I've been doing some work on it, and like they're coming at it from many angles, but I couldn't see an archaeology. There's, there's no, you're absolutely right, there's no archaeology. So I do want to talk to them about that. And so I think they'd be a great partner to have. And, you know, I, I think they'd help in publicizing these small, because there are one or two other little local museums. There's some in the Negev, Bedouin run mm -hmm. museums and things like that. So it'd be nice to become part of that network. And I think that's going to be an amazing museum when it opens. You know, if there are plans, if you can go to their website, if you search for the Palestinian Museum, all their architectural plans are up there. It's brilliant. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to them, absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. Okay. We really, really appreciate it. Come to the pub and I'll talk to you more. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Thank you Brian.